Lord, we um, surrender to you as the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Thank you that you've helped us to know you. For those who penned the Nicene Creed all those years ago to help us understand the truths of your word. Impart uh, these truths more deeply to us, we ask in your name. Amen. So we've come to the third talk on the Nicene Creed. We're looking at we believe in the Holy Spirit and those um, affirmations that come afterwards. So we believe in the Holy Spirit. But is it really true and demonstrable from the way that we live? I want to give this talk on the Nicene Creed, this final one, in a very practical way. I'm going to give us three very practical ways to know if this is true that we believe in the Holy Spirit and explore some of the other statements contained within the Creed. As with God the Father and God the Son, it is possible to say that we believe something. Anyone can say, I believe something, but we sometimes just mean we know something is true. The kind of knowledge that God wants is experiential. So when the King James Version said that Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived in uh, Genesis chapter four, I think it is, it didn't mean that Adam knew that was Eve over there and could just affirm, yeah, that's Eve. It meant that he had sexual relations with her. And you see this in the Hebrew language in the Old Testament, that to know um, is a way of describing, um, it's a way of describing sex and uh, that kind of knowing of someone. So there's a difference between knowing in head knowledge and in heart knowledge, which is captured in the Hebrew language for us. Adam knew his wife Eve, and we need to know the Holy Spirit, not just about the Holy Spirit. So we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. Well, firstly, we will be able to tell this is true from our prayer life, if this is true from our prayer life. If we truly believe that God does all things by his spirit, including imparting life. It will make you a person who prays for yourself, your friends, your church, the world, and the list goes on. You'll know that it's the Lord who builds the house, and without him, the builders labour in vain. So you'll be someone who prays and continually asks God to do those things that only he can do. If God is an impersonal agent of some kind, you'll not assume that you can have anything from him. You'll just think he's over there and I can know things about him. But if he unites us to himself by the spirit and sanctifies us uh, by the spirit and gives us gifts by the spirit, you'll want to cry out to him. The spirit is the spirit who is present at creation, as we heard uh, in our reading, Genesis 1, verse 2. He's re referred to as the Spirit of God. It's possibly not the best translation. The he Hebrew boffins tell me that could be wind of God. That might be a better translation. But even if that is so, we know that the wind of God is a concrete description of the Holy Spirit. Wind and breath are images that are used to describe the work of the Holy Spirit um, elsewhere in the Bible. The creed refers to him as Lord, because again, in Christian belief, the Holy Spirit is fully God and is equal with the Father and the Son. And it tells us that before the creation, the Holy Spirit was present and active. Although believers had understood it since the dawn of time, you could argue, in 381 AD, the Council of Constantinople formally endorsed the full divinity of the Holy Spirit, putting it beyond doubt. The Spirit is constantly active in the in the Bible, doing those things that only God can do. The Spirit is described as the Spirit of justice and compassion. So Isaiah 42, 1, I've put my Spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations, talking about the Messiah there. And then Micah 3, verse 8, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord and with justice. The Spirit also is the Spirit who convicts. So we'll pray for God to open the eyes of the blind, to believe his truth and be saved. For that colleague, that child, that public figure, for our king. The spirit regenerates as well, does the rebirth within, sanctifies, adopts us into God's family. Romans 8 speaks of the spirit of adoption. The spirit of adoption. And... He's the spirit who satisfies. We're told that even in 
uh, that even Jesus in Luke 10, verse 21, rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. He's the spirit of power who gives gifts, anoints for service, author of the Bible, known as the sword of the spirit. And so we will pray, pray, pray if we believe in the Holy Spirit. Thinking myself, I know that sometimes I allow administration to crowd out prayer. But when I do that, I'm suggesting that I believe more in my own strength than God's spirit who will grow the church. I wonder if you can sympathise with this and how you try and get things done. So I spend way too much time thinking about how to get a leader for this group or that, when I should give 90% of that time to prayer. Oh, there's so much to learn. You see, to a large degree, I'm in control of sending emails and having conversations with people. Even worrying can feel like a productive use of time, though that's a lie. If I truly believe in God's Holy Spirit, I will pray about these things. I will trust God to provide someone if he wants that ministry to go ahead. I have a dream that we will see a movement of prayer in our church. Uh, one of the things I'm feeling challenged by the Lord to pray for is that every year, 10 or more people will become truly alive to prayer. That 10 or more people in our church will become truly alive. That the, that the church prayer meeting would grow by 10 people every year. And I know... Probably you might be thinking only 10, but, you know, in three years time, that would mean there was 50 people in the prayer meeting. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I realise that many Christians simply don't pray. But brothers and sisters, we're missing out on such an incredible privilege if we don't practice prayer. You know that among us, prayer has caused us to see people healed with no medical explanation, personal crises to be overcome broken people to find strength and healing, new ministries to be started, anger and bitterness to be replaced by joy, love, and a fresh lease of life. This life comes from the Father and the Son through the Holy Spirit. You see, when Jesus left earth, he said that it was good that he might go, that he might leave behind a counsellor. Uh, and and th that was the gift from the Father. He's a gift. The Holy Spirit is God's gift to you. I believe that God is calling for us to pray for our church to become alive to prayer. And as I say, I'm praying for 10 people to become alive every year. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, and that will make us pray. Well, we'll know that we believe in the Spirit. Secondly, if we're enjoying fellowship with the Father and the Son. After all, the Spirit glorifies the Father and the Son. The creed tells us also that he proceeds from the Father and the Son. Now that became known as the filioque clause. And this is something that uh, we've taken for granted in the Western church today. However, um, if you've studied some theology, you might know that this was a source of controversy in the early church. We won't spend lots of time upon it, but I want to explain it to you. It was centered upon uh, the way that the Roman church and the Greek church or Churches of East and West, West and East, understood uh, the relationship of the Spirit to the other persons of the Trinity. Now, the Eastern Church strongly held to the belief that the Spirit proceeded from the Father, but not also from the Son. So, uh, for, for the Greek Church, the Spirit just proceeded from the Father. Whereas the Latin Church, the Roman Church, which won out in the Nicene Creed, believed that it was from the Father and the Son that the Spirit proceeded. So why does this all matter? Because it just sounds incredibly pernickety, doesn't it, to our 21st century ears. Well, I think the Latin position is captured in our creeds more helpful. Uh, in John 20, 22, we're told that Christ breathes upon his disciples and they receive the Holy Spirit. I personally find it helpful in seeing that those who want a deeper experience of the Spirit need to go to Jesus. They need to be Jesus people who know the Father through the Son. It reminds us that the Holy Spirit is also called the Spirit of Christ in the Bible. It reminds us that the Spirit always wants to conform us more to Jesus. By uh, In the Creed, reflecting the, the fact that the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, it reminds us that there's a close relationship to the Son and that the Spirit wants to conform us into his likeness. The Spirit takes from the things of Jesus and gives them to us. Now, my nervousness sometimes about the so-called, I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but uh, that movement which is labelled as the charismatic movement, uh, my nervousness is that it's made a lot of 
uh, emphasis upon the spirit. And while this is good, I sometimes feel as an outsider looking in that it has has been that there's been less emphasis upon being Jesus people and making much of him. So gifts and experience of the spirit get promoted, but sometimes there's less talk about knowing Jesus and loving him, preaching his name. Uh, that's why at St. John's, our values are to be Jesus-centred, Bible-centred, and gospel-centred. Um, we can't just say, oh, we want the gifts of the spirit. We do, but it's by being Jesus-focused uh, people and knowing the Father through Jesus. Uh, an, an article on the Gospel Coalition website put it like this. For Christians who desire to make Christ the center of God's redeeming activity, the filioque clause does a nice job of emphasizing that point from Scripture. So the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Well, next, uh, we'll know that we believe in the Holy Spirit if we are Bible people. Uh, we believe in the Holy Spirit. Who has spoken through the prophets? In Acts 1 verse 2, it says that Jesus gave instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he'd chosen. They were the ones who went on to write the New Testament. If we believe in the Holy Spirit. We want to study and respect the Bible as God's authoritative word to us because he gave instructions to his apostles by the Spirit. The prophets, who were actually the ones mentioned here, uh, had a similar and, and vital role preparing the word um, of the Old Testament writing the Old Testament, preparing us for Christ's coming. Now, I can't put it better than the Apostle Peter when he writes, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. Prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though humans, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It became popular in the, in the church. It's become popular in uh, the church today to do a form of evangelism that's sometimes known as treasure hunting. Uh, and what that involves, and you see this in, in missions and things, uh, in towns and things like that, uh, when churches do it, you'd ask the Holy Spirit who to go up to on your university campus or in your street and to give you a word to say to them, you know, hunting for the right person for, for treasure. And I don't want to be dismissive because I think that this is it's good to ask the Lord Good to ask for the Spirit's direction on who you ought to share your faith with, uh, what to say to them that, that, that's kind of a right emphasis and a right thing to say. But if the Holy Spirit has authored the Bible, we must make a central part of our evangelism, giving them the opportunity to let God speak to them through his word, surely. Again, that's why we want to be Bible centered and to use the Bible to reach people and inspire faith. Because we believe that the Holy Spirit has spoken through the prophets. Of course, saying we're Bible people is not just card carrying, or at least it shouldn't be. It's seeking not just to be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And so we pray that the Holy Spirit would use the Bible in our lives to encourage us and shape us according to his will and to work in the lives of others as well. Uh, the creed then ends with some affirmations about the church, baptism, resurrection and the future. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Why is this important? Well, by Catholic, we recognize that the church contains those who through the ages have trusted in Christ and met together in his name. We're not prisoners. We shouldn't be prisoners to, to our own generation, thinking that we have all the answers. We're not arrogant enough to think that only our local church or our diocese or our denomination has the truth to the exclusion of others. <laughs> We've all met people who believe that. The cults tell you you must join their club to have the truth. We say worship Jesus and meet with his people in any number of possible expressions where Christ is truly worshipped, loved, and the word is faithfully proclaimed, along with uh, the sacraments. While we ought to be part of a specific local church, there are Christians among all kinds uh, of churches, among the Baptists, the Presbyterian, the Brethren, the Methodists, the Pentecostal. We're Christians who worship in very different ways to us. So what must the church be? It must be one that stands in the apostolic faith. If a church doesn't hold to the teaching that the apostles gave us in the New Testament, and we have to say with sadness, they've departed from the truth. And Catholic doesn't mean Roman Catholic. 
it's not a capital C there, but a lower C. Uh, we're not saying in the creed that we believe in the Roman Catholic Church, although the Roman Church sees itself as the one true church. That's not what we're saying. Indeed, I know of one Anglican church that's replaced the word Catholic with universal, just to be clear on that. We believe in one holy, universal and apostolic church. So I hope you can see uh, that point, that we're declaring that we're part of something that extends beyond ourselves. Uh, this something is the church, which is being called by Christ, is being built by Christ in the world and for whom Christ will return. Now, Glenn spoke candidly about, candidly about his own relationship to a changing Church of England uh, a couple of weeks ago, which, as we understand, it is uh, considering departing from apostolic faith in relation to its understanding of human sexuality, because the apostles taught on that in the New Testament. Uh, if the C of E changed its official doctrine on human sexuality, we might reach the conclusion that we're no longer part of an apostolic church. And as Glyn said, thankfully, there's uh, a large number of people standing in the gap saying we mustn't do that. As Glyn suggested, I think we have, I don't think we've got there yet. And uh, we must stay and fight as long as we possibly can, I think. I find it compelling that the prophets did not abandon Israel, the ancient church, regardless of what it did. They stayed as a remnant within uh, an unfaithful people speaking truth to those in error. Maybe that we can persuade the church it needs to return to apostolic faith or to continue with apostolic faith. Maybe we can persuade the church it needs to create a space where apostolically faithful churches can have their own bishops and hold to the faith as received by the saints. A settlement to avoid a messy divorce within the Church of England, if it comes to that. Uh, this is what we're currently contending for at St. John's with the Church of England the Evangelical Council making our case. Well, one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Mark tells us that John the Baptist preached a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, Mark 1.4. It ties confession and baptism together. Now, I know what you're thinking. How does that work with an infant? who cannot confess their sins because they can't talk yet. Well, in the Anglican understanding, baptism is the sign of the covenant, rather like boys were circumcised according to the Old Testament law. When the, apostle, um, when the apostles preach, they don't believe everyone who has circumcision has true faith. In fact, Jesus himself calls some of those who've been circumcised a brood of vipers. So he doesn't believe that the sign is sufficient on its own. So baptism, likewise, has to be joined with faith at some point. Baptism can also have a spiritual meaning in the Bible. Uh, so Peter can say, this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you, 2 Peter 3.21. The water symbolism uh, symbolizes a spiritual event of coming to know Jesus and being saved from death. So when we say one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we're not saying that being dunked or splashed saves you. Because the outward sign represents an inward reality. The New Testament sometimes uses the word baptism to refer to the inward reality. Indeed, it sometimes seems to refer to the water event to describe an inward reality. Think of John the Baptist in Matthew 3, verse 11, speaking of Jesus. Speaking of Jesus, he says, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So we believe in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. I think the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come are fairly self-explanatory, but ask me if you want any clarification on uh, those points. Brothers and sisters, we must believe in the Holy Spirit. More than that, we must depend upon him, know him, keep in step with him. We must go on being filled with the Spirit Ephesians 5.18. I'm blown away that God would give us this precious gift. God, the Holy Spirit, to live within us. And uh, this is what Paul writes in Ephesians 5.18, and I'll close with this. Be filled with the Spirit. Now, that is a, a present tense verb in the Greek. And I believe it's continuous as well. So you could translate it as go on being filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another with psalms 
hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always give thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.